introduce the department then has pursued and they're combining from biology and fundamental questions that he's pursuing is a variety of engineering approaches that certainly has left a mark which I don't do that often if I go uh, out and talk to people, they always tell me, oh, Ellen is doing this really interesting stuff in synthetic biology. Well, where, where does this come from? Let me give you a brief synopsis. So mm -hmm. I started with a solid training in biochemistry at UBC, where he received a bachelor's degree in 2001. He went on to Berkeley to work with Dan Fletcher and received a PhD in biophysics in 2007. And then I guess that wasn't not sunny enough. So he went to Smith. On um, mostly endopsychosis. And uh, of course, all of these things combined with this new home in the led him to pursue these new adventures that I hinted at. So, uh, without taking any further time from Helen, uh, let's hear what he has to tell us today about the mechanobiology of membranes for mechanotransduction to the artificial cytoskeleton. All right. Yeah, it's on, it's on. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Edgar. That was a very kind introduction and uh, really appreciate that remark. Um, so can you really hear me? Okay, might actually drop again. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, share with you today some of the uh, recent work that's done in my lab. I know this is a very, very broad audience, so I've actually made a, a talk specifically for the department. So hope you enjoy. Um, obviously, I need to uh, calibrate everybody's understanding of the kind of work my lab does. So I'll start with some very generic uh, introduction, and then we're going to share with you three little stories uh, that my lab has worked on in the recent years. Um, I'd like to say hi to the Zoom people. I see Alan Wyman there. It's so great to see you. Um, all right, so let me dive right in. So my lab is broadly interested in this mechanobiology of membranes, but we use uh, approaches uh, in quantitative cell biology, cell mechanics, uh, synthetic biology, and microfluidics. And these tools from the different uh, areas, uh, is there any on there, uh, intersects with this, you know, interesting, oh, yes. I was wondering if you could display the slides that we want to read on the side screen. Just give it a few uh, yeah. Murray. Okay. okay, yeah, we can make that happen. Okay. All right, one second then. Sure. Your slides. Of course. There you go. That was easy. Thank, thank you, Michael. Um, right. So, so my lab really uh, takes tools from a variety of uh, disciplines and, and with the focus of understanding mechanobiology uh, membranes. I'm going to share with you why I'm interested in this topic. Um, first of all, uh, you know, I really uh, get inspired by nature. Uh, and there are a variety of uh, organisms. In fact, all organisms uh, on Earth are mechanosensitive. So they respond to mechanical forces and respond in a particular way. So uh, here on the top left, you have a C. elegans, the tiny worm that is a model system for uh, uh, different uh, cell processes and organismal uh, behavior that when it's probed on the top left, you can see that uh, it reverses direction. And here are a couple examples from the plant world, mimosa plants and Venus fry trap that they have this ability to mechanically respond to forces. Uh, and this next video here, uh, let me just uh, warn you, it's a, it's a dead squid, um, but when you touch it, it, or when you probe it, it, it actually dances. So, uh, and this is a delicacy in Japan, and um, it's actually not mechanical sensitive, but it's uh, sensitive to, to the ions that uh, is in the, uh, uh, in the soy sauce. In any case, if you, um, you know, as a kid, I would you know, go to nature and look at insects and look at you know animals and if you wanted to know if something is dead or alive your instinct is to probe it is to mechanically probe it i think all of us would do the same thing um, so i'm really fascinated by the ability for a uh, living system to uh, sense and respond to forces uh, let me share another video and this is a, a video that captured my uh, interest in cell migration from uh, uh, in my in my early graduate school days 
This is a movie taken by David Rogers uh, from the from Vanderbilt University in the 1950s. This is done on a 60 millimeter uh, uh, you know, film. And what you're seeing is this is a, a white blood cell. Let me show you this. Uh, this is a white blood cell and these are red blood cells are surrounding it. And here there's a tiny bacterium. And what we know is that the uh, neutrophil, these white blood cells will actually chase after bacterium in a process called chemotaxis. Um, so you can watch how smart this neutrophil is in chasing after a tiny bacterium. And it turns out the bacterium secretes a tiny peptide. And this peptide is being sensed by uh, receptors on, uh, on, this, on, on the cell. And the cell, uh, this neutrophil is ignoring all the red, uh, red blood cell around it. Uh, and at the end of the movie, this actually, uh, the, 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 uh, the neutrophil actually eats this bacterium and internalizes it. Uh, it's lunchtime, so uh, for, for the neutrophil. So broadly speaking, my lab is interested in a couple questions, right? So this is talking about at a very, very broad level is how do cells sense and respond to physical forces? And this is the field called mechanical transduction. And secondly is how do cells uh, generate mechanical forces to enable their movement? So every single process uh, in a cell has to uh, involve some type of movement and the cell at the micro level has to uh, 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 find a way to, 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 to generate force and deform their membrane. And this is in shape transformation like cell division or migration. So these are the broad questions I'm most interested in. So the, the, the bottle system my lab use involve both living cells as well as a uh, cell-like system. And you're gonna hear both of these in my, my talk today. And these are what I call synthetic or artificial cells. And um, so what I wanna uh, share with you today are three little stories. I know the audience is quite diverse and, uh, and I specifically pick three stories that have some type of theme. Uh, around cell skeleton. And first is to talk about how compressive stress would actually uh, uh, drive this uh, jamming on jamming transitions in a, in a 2D model layer uh, to model uh, breast cancer migration. The second is to look at cell organizations of actin filaments in the confined system. Uh, and, and, and the third is to uh, look at how uh, these actin in a, in, a, uh, in a cell actually modulate the mechanical properties of single cells and also look at that uh, when it's encapsulated in a in a, in a uh, confined vesicle system. So these are three little stories um, that I will share with you. Um, and before I move on to these stories, I wanna give a couple more uh, introductory slides on sort of mechanical transductions and, and, and cell skeleton in general. So this paradigm of mechanical transduction is about, I would say 20 years old-ish, and is a relatively new field in uh, biology and engineering, right? So what we're ultimately interested in is understanding how physical stimuli and that exists in our body, right? So think about endothelial cells that senses your stress. Think about your lung uh, expand and contract that, uh, and, 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 uh, and the extracellular matrix rigidity all have a influence on cell function. Uh, and the cell functions people are most interested in include gene expression or cell migration, the ability for cell to move. Now, what is a mysterious thing in the field for many, many years is what are the mechanical sensors? What are the proteins that actually uh, sense these mechanical forces and, and, and allow the cells to respond to them? And there are a variety of, of uh, machinery that, that uh, do this. Uh, in, that includes mechanical sense and ion channel, which my lab studies, uh, adhesion protein between cells, uh, focal adhesions that are uh, essentially uh, the bridge between the cell and the underlying extracellular matrix, uh, receptors, and certainly the cell skeleton. So what is the cell skeleton, right? So um, which I'll get into. And these are all the things that my lab studies, okay? Um, and actually beyond that, uh, what I highlighted here. Uh, so the cell skeleton uh, involves three different types of biopolymer networks. There's the actin cell skeleton, the microtubules, and the intermediate filaments. And my lab is particularly interested in the actin cell skeleton. So it's a, it's a polymer, and depicting here is a very, uh, it's a semi-flexible polymer of eight nanometer in, 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 uh, in width, um, and has a, a polarity. So there's a plus N and a minus N. Now for the purpose of this talk, you just have to um, understand or, or or at least uh, uh, follow the idea that these exist as monomers and they can polymerize into active filaments. So it's, a, it's an equilibrium between the two. Now inside the cells, there are a lot of proteins that regulate the dynamics of this system. And I think of it as a very remarkable structural material for a cell, that these active filaments can be remodeled a variety of ways. So there are bundling proteins that can stitch these uh, filaments together and form a tight bundle. Uh, there are motor proteins that will generate contraction between uh, two filaments and slide them across, and this is how it works in your muscle. Uh, there are proteins that will bind to the side, the proteins that will bind to the end, there are proteins that will cross-link these into a gel or into a network, uh, and there are proteins that will serve them, so uh, cut them into pieces. And, uh, and these are 
uh, essentially the, the structural material that allows the cell to dynamically uh, regulate its, its motion and, and also uh, other uh, important processes here. Um, so, so the take home uh, thing from this uh, background is that there's basically a host of these actin binding proteins uh, that allow the regulation of a very, uh, to my my a very beautiful machinery. Okay. So uh, I'm going to show you one more video, and this is a, a very fascinating uh, video as well, uh, done by um, captured by by uh, Gary Borsi, who used to be at Northwestern. And so uh, before I show this video, uh, this video is about a piece of a cell that is cut off from its body. And this is a cell that's the fastest moving cell that we have sort of come to learn, uh, mammalian uh, or, or uh, uh, multi, you know, um, this is coming from fish scale. So it's basically a cell, it's called fish keratocyte. And uh, the cell moved really, really rapidly. And, um, and if you take a pipette and just cut out a piece of the cell, it sits there. Um, and then if you mechanically probe it, the cells, this piece of the cell will actually break symmetry and start moving, okay? So I'm gonna just give you the sort of narrative. So this is a piece of cell, it's not a whole cell. And when you touch it, it starts moving. It breaks the symmetry and it spontaneously moves. And, and you know, when I saw this, this is you know, fascinating to me that um, all the machinery that are, that are within this piece of a cell, within the cytoplasm, uh, actually encodes all the information to drive motion of, of this piece of cell. Um, so if you look back to the movie that I showed you earlier, uh, the mutual field chasing after bacterium, Really, the cell has this remarkable ability to control its cell skeleton at a very, very fast time scale. Actually, people have shown this is less than a second, right? So they can actually uh, polymerize the actin filament uh, at, a, at a certain uh, location, and there's a signal that drives its motion. It will disassemble the cell skeleton and reorganize it very, very rapidly to drive uh, its motion uh, in a new direction, right? So, so if you saw, remember the migrating neutrophil, that was a very good example of, of how quickly a cell is able to navigate, okay? Um, all right, so with that in mind, uh, this is the first of my three, first three story. This is largely driven by uh, a graduate student, uh, uh, Grace Kai from uh, Applied Physics, and where we're looking at how compressive stress drives this unjamming transition in breast cancer. Uh, so the context of this is, is metastasis. So most of the cell uh, sort of death of patients uh, from cancer is not coming from the primary tumor, but the secondary tumor. And they uh, do so by migrating out of the primary tumor uh, as single cells or as sheet of cells, and they have to actually undergo uh, a very treacherous uh, journey in order to get to the, its new destination. Uh, so I call this a forced journey of a cell. Um, and essentially the cells have to uh, crawl through a very dense extracellular matrix um, that is not really depicted in here. And then it has to actually get through into the blood vessel and escape out of the blood vessel and then fly through another set of uh, extracellular matrix in order to get to its new uh, location. So we're interested in looking at how a cell is able to disseminate from this primary tumor and then how it might actually uh, go to a different location and what, how does force regulate this process. Before I get onto the study itself, I just wanna uh, introduce a, a concept uh, called epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Um, so this essentially is a sheet of cell from top view and, and sort of lateral view. When a cell moves, uh, there is leader cells and follower cells. Uh, cells can have uh, forces between them. So there is cell-cell contact and there are also cell matrix interaction. So the cell is uh, uh, adhering to the, to the, the substrate. Uh, in, the, in the epithelial migration mode, it has strong intercellular junction. So the cells are really uh, sort of glued together. And then the follower cells basically has high um, uh, you know, traction forces. So this is one mode of migration. Now, what happens in cancer biochemically is this transition from this uh, epithelial mode to the mesenchymal mode where uh, the cell cell junction become loose so that the cells can actually break off from the sheet. And the follow cells have very weak junctions and also very weak intercellular junctions. So this is how uh, sort of cancer biologists have envisioned cancer to work is this through this epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Um, so, and this would be important because what we have discovered is a, a, a different mechanism or different ways of getting cells to move that, that doesn't follow this epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Now, the mechanical stimuli that we're interested in study is compressive stress. And this is a, 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 a type of uh, um, you know, force that is important in physiology, right? So uh, in, in terms of bone, um, you know, when you stand, obviously you're loading uh, you know, uh, force onto, onto your bone. Uh, in tumor, we have a, a lot of compressive stress that accumulates uh, when the tumor cells grow into a uh, dense body. And, uh, uh, and on, the, on the surface, you have the tensile stress. On the interior, you have this compressive stress. So these confinement stress are very, very uh, important in tumor growth and actually will block 
uh, certain nutrient from getting in and so on. And certainly in cell invasion, this is an in vitro study that showed that uh, compressive stress actually would cause these uh, cells to go out of uh, all edges instead of uh, just leaving from the corners of this pattern cell. So um, you might notice in my, the title of this uh, subject was, was on jamming. So we have to look at um, sort of a little bit of uh, physics behind jamming on jamming here. And obviously this is not a new concept. It's been around for you know, 20 plus years. Essentially it's a transition that uh, physicists have described for granular materials, glasses, bones, and, uh, and motions um, that basically you can be in a jam state uh, and when you apply load or when the temperature goes up or when you uh, reduce density, you can actually unjam. OK, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a transition that can be used to describe physical matter. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, biophysicists uh, physicists have also envisioned this jamming on jamming transition to apply to cell migration. So when the cells are very, very dense, they can be jammed. And, uh, and, and upon certain perturbations, they can actually unjam and begin moving as a, as, a, as, a, as a sheet or as a single cell. So in this analogous, and this is a hypothetical phase diagram for uh, a jamming on jamming transition for cells. And you can see that there's a axis of motility, one over adhesion, and one over density. So this is sort of a, analogous to uh, the phase diagram on the left for, uh, for other type of uh, uh, soft matters. Um, so the, you know, the underlying um, understanding of, of, of thinking about uh, you know, jamming on jamming transition for cell sheet comes from some of the early uh, studies using vertex model to, uh, to sort of under, understand how shape will influence the motion of, of, uh, of, of cells in, in, a, uh, in a 2D model layer. So this is a vertex model that describes uh, cells as individual uh, polygons, and you can, uh, you know, derive a shape uh, uh, index that is basically the perimeter divided by the square root uh, area. And if this number is below 3.813, it's a solid uh, uh, face. And then if you go above this number, then you become fully like. So a cell can actually propagate. Uh, it's, you know, you'll see a small animation later that a cell uh, uh, will basically uh, move in this 2D layer. Now, um, there's different type of mechanical energy that's associated with a cell uh, in this type of model uh, that the cell area will describe uh, area compressibility, cell parameter uh, describing the uh, stiffness and contractility of an actomyosin ring, which is a force generating uh, machinery in a cell that determine uh, this, 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 the shape of a cell and also cell-cell contact. So how much adhesion is between uh, two cells. Uh, so in a cell monolayer, that's jam. So the question we're asked in this particular project is if a cell monolayer is jam, can we unjam it? And is it possible to use mechanical stimuli to unjam uh, this, this monolayer similar to what uh, the face diagram showed you a, 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 page or, a, a slide earlier? Now get to the science part. Uh, we work with two cell types in this particular study. So one is a normal uh, breast, cancer, uh, breast epithelial cell called MCF10A. The second is a, is a uh, memory carcinoma cells for mouse that's called 41s. OK, now, if you look at the normal cells, uh, MCF10A, this is a, called a wound healing assay, a wound scratch assay. What you do is you, you make a scratch of a monolayer, and these fluorescent images basically are showing you the cells. Uh, as a function of time, you can see that these, these cells will close. Just like if you have a wound on your skin, this wound will close. Uh, if you do this in, a, in, a, in, a, in an experiment, the cells will close this wound and basically have a monolayer again. Now, in the presence of a compressive stress, you can see that this wound doesn't close properly. Okay? So that is with the normal cells. What happens when you have the 41 cells is that it's completely opposite. So that in the absence of uh, compressive stress, the migrations are very, very hindered. Uh, and then uh, in contrast, when you have the compressive stress, this monolayer are actually able to close, right? So it's a complete opposite of uh, uh, behavior. And this is quantified over here. Again, where in the absence of stress, you are able to close uh, the wind completely. And then when you apply stress, it doesn't, doesn't close and 41 behaves complete opposite. Um, just to show you a video of how that looks, and this is in hours, and you can see it's a little, uh, there's a fluid motion. Uh, let me just see if I can play this again. That it initially is a very slow uh, uh, closure, and then after that, you have this, you know, very rapid uh, movement between the two cell sheets. So uh, from this observation, Grace thought, okay, so the 41 cells are, are unjammed under compressive stress. What is actually triggering this? And uh, and and um, and we look at whether this is, has to do with jamming on jamming, and through looking at the shapes of these cells. So uh, I've already introduced the shape index, and this is a little animation showing the cells can actually propagate its movement uh, if it breaks over this uh, three point eight one uh, uh, shape index, and they become unjammed. So if you uh, look at uh, MCF10A, this normal cells, there's actually no uh, changes uh, to the shape index 
uh, as a function of different compressive stress. Whereas in 41 cells, we see an increase in the shape index, consistent with the idea that this is uh, going to the unjemmy uh, uh, transition. And we also see the same thing with the nucleus as well. So we, mo we um, quantify both the cell shape of the cell cell, but also the nucleus uh, shape index. And we see both of these uh, increases uh, with compressive stress for the 41 cells. So how does this happening? And, and we suspect, you know, if I, uh, so I introduced, you know, uh, contractility earlier, I introduced cell-cell adhesion, uh, Grace decided to look at cell-cell adhesion. So the, the interaction between two cells, how are they stuck together? Uh, so just to give you a little bit more uh, uh, names of the molecules. So this is, uh, e-coherent is a molecule that binds the two cells together. So this is one cell on the top and there is another cell at the bottom. The cells can stick to each other like Velcro. Right, so you, you, they're stuck to each other uh, using this uh, this protein, and there are a lot of other proteins that are uh, you know interacting with with e-coherent, and finally that that complex will engage the cell skeleton to allow force transmission to happen. What Grace observed is that uh, e-coherent, when we do immunofluorescence labeling this molecule, we see that as you increase in, in uh, compressive stress, we do not change the e-coherent intensity uh, when you just analyze the periphery of the cells. In contrast, uh, this is very different when you look at the 41 cells where you see an increase in the uh, intensity of the e-coherent around the cell-cell uh, junctions uh, as you increase stress. So what that means is that as you apply compressive stress, the 41 cells are actually binding to each other harder, or, or they have a, uh, at least the interpretation is that they are adhering to each other more compared to the, to the, to the uh, MCF10A cells. Um, so, uh, so, so what we want to look at next is how much force is this uh, system generating? And we use a, uh, a technique called traction force microscopy, and it's just very quickly is you embed uh, fluorescent beads on, this, on the elastic substrates, and you can look at how much force a cell is generating on this, uh, on this substrate by comparing the deformed state versus a no-cell reference state. Um, and you can compute uh, the, the traction forces uh, uh, that way. So here, um, here are two different experiments. One is to look at a, a, a pattern substrates, and I won't go into detail of, of, of this, but essentially we can confine the cells in the circular pattern. And in the 10A cells, um, you, know, you can see that there's not much traction. So this is a scale of the traction stresses uh, in this color code. There's no compressive stress, and then the bottom is with compression. And in 14-1 cells, you see that um, there's no, uh, sorry, there's, there's high amount of compressive stress, and then when you compress it, it goes away. But what is interesting is if you look at a wound edge, so this is the experiment that you know, we, we observe uh, this rapid wound closure. Uh, in the presence of compressive stress for 41 cells, you still maintain a very high level of traction stresses uh, at the leading edge of the cell compared to uh, mcf 10 a where all the traction stresses are gone. Okay, so, uh, and, then, and then if you look at the bulk layer, so this is the cell behind it, um, there's not much reduction uh, of the, the bulk um, a slight amount of uh, reduction in the bulk, uh, in the in the bulk monolayer. So just to, uh, I know there's a lot of data, but just to walk you through the trends here, uh, that in 41 cells in the wound healing stage, you see um, no reductions in the leading edge traction forces, whereas the four, uh, MCF 10A you see a reduction in traction. Okay, and then in the bulk there is a reduction in, in in both. So how do how do you think through this? So for a cell to move, it needs to generate traction stress, just like how we move. We need to push. The ground behind us in order to propel ourselves forward. Now, if the if the cells in the front are able to generate high traction, still under compressive stress, is able to to push itself. Now, the 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 cells behind us or behind the, the leading edge of the cells are adhering to each other very strongly. So essentially, they are able to pull the entire cell sheet together. Okay, just by having maintaining the high traction stresses at the front and maintaining high adhesive uh, uh, um, strength between uh, neighboring cells at the back. Uh, this. 41 cells are able to advance as a, as a sheet. So that is our understanding of this. So hopefully, so that, that explanation uh, makes sense. Um, all right, so that's just what I said is that the 41 cell maintain leading attraction while reduce attraction in the bulk. So they're not really contributing to friction if you think about it of, of, the, of the back, but it's just being lifted up and, and migrating very fluidly, I guess. So uh, the final thing we did is we collaborated with uh, Max B from Northeastern University, and he's a, a, a theorist that um, essentially one of the first people to come up with this jamming and jamming transition for cells. Um, uh, done a lot of work in that space, and this is a theoretical phase boundary, and he took our measurements and map it into a phase diagram. So this is the jam space is on jam space, and the 41 cells you can cross from the jam state to on jam state with compressive stress. 
Whereas in the 10A cells, it actually uh, uh, goes from the ungem state to the gem state where you compress the cell. So it sort of uh, makes sense from that angle that you can actually cross the phase boundary in different directions. And, uh, and this is sort of behavior you can observe. Okay, so quickly to summarize, um, uh, I'm gonna hurry up just a little bit. So the, uh, the compressive stress differentially impacts enclosure of the, uh, of the normal breast cancer cells. Uh, versus the, the, sorry, the normal cell versus the breast cancer cells. Uh, and then we show that compressive stress can unjam these uh, breast cancer cells. Uh, and this unjamming uh, transition, I didn't emphasize that too much, is actually uh, uh, distinct from this epithelial mesenchymal transition. So I actually took out that data to show that it, it's not following the EMT. If you re recall, this e coherent is actually up regulated, or I guess it goes to the cell membrane, but we also found the expression is higher. So it's actually not, um, not the same as EMT here. Uh, this epithelial mesenchymal transition. Uh, finally, we think this is due to increase uh, cell cell adhesion while reducing cell matrix interactions at the back, but maintaining uh, the cell uh, matrix in, uh, attractions at the front. That's actually driving this on jamming. Okay, so quickly, the current work that Grace is pursuing, and, and Samuel and, and Catherine uh, in my lab are doing is to, to uh, put this into a 3D context. So we're working with 3D spheroids, and there have some really beautiful data that I uh, won't be able to share. Uh, about how these cells can actually uh, sort uh, in the context of a, a co-culture model and then escape out of this uh, 3D spheroids and, and uh, in the presence of different levels of confinement stress and very exciting work. Okay, so I'm going to transition to my second uh, part of talk and, and looked at uh, cell organizations of this uh, actin networks and compliance system. Uh, and this is my second, sort of the second model system in my lab. And, and a good portion of my lab actually uh, looks at building synthetic cells. And these are, uh, as Edgar alluded to, that my lab does some work in synthetic biology, and we're particularly interested in uh, building cell-like system that models some behaviors of a cell. Uh, and this is sort of the grand scheme of, 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 of probably many, many years of work uh, in the future, uh, as well as now, is to see if we can build a system that can take different inputs, uh, perform different outputs using a cell-like system that we can engineer uh, in our lab. Uh, the, Goal ultimately is to see if we can assemble biological components in a meaningful way that will recapitulate some feature or some functions of a cell. Um, this type of uh, uh, study started with my PhD work that I was uh, probably the first person to build this type of system using a, a giant unit of vesicle and, and assemble an actin network on it. And this is complete vitro. This is not a cell uh, where I you know, study the interactions between actin and, and, and membrane uh, in this type of reconstitutive system. At the time, I was very fascinated by the uh, potential to ultimately build a cell by just merging all these different modules together. And uh, essentially, these are cartoon that um, can be sort of uh, each, each of these functions can be reconstituted in vitro and then put together in a, in a, in a cell-like context. Um, so uh, I'm going to keep our focus just the cell skeleton, that the active cell skeleton is something that can self-assemble into a diverse structure. I showed you the, the cartoon of, of different modifications that can happen. Uh, so we asked, can we create a synthetic cell with an internal cell skeleton? And this is what I refer to as artificial cell skeleton. Um, for this little story, uh, I just want to introduce two molecules. So this is a, a cross-linker called FASIN. It's a six nanometer uh, molecule. And then there's another cross-linker called alpha actinin. Uh, this is found in muscles, and this is uh, found in a structure called philopodia. It's a much longer molecule, 35 nanometers. And this is important. Um, and previously, people have shown that if you take two filaments together and if you have these two different cross-linkers, uh, they will actually uh, uh, self-segregate into domains where the short cross-linker would localize to one area of this uh, uh, filament, um, two filaments, and then long cross-linker will go to a, another part of filament. So alpha actin forms a square lattice, whereas fasten forms this hexagonal lattice, and these uh, are important energetically to sort of segregate them so that they don't, um, you know, having to bend uh, short, uh, around things. So, um, so we already have some intuition from um, from from these two filament system that these uh, proteins will self you know self segregate. Okay. Um, so what we want to do uh, for this project is to put these things inside a, a giant unit vesicle. Okay, as a, as a model for synthetic cell. Uh, for this, uh, we use a technique called CDICE, continuous droplet interface cross encapsulation. Uh, essentially, you generate a, a very quickly generate emulsion. So the phase you want to, to make uh, synthetic cells are, uh, are these, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, aqueous phase that you can disperse them into oil phase and make these tiny emulsion droplets. And then you spin them through uh, on this little device right here. This is a 3D printed chamber. The emulsion flies through this uh, oil phase. And when it reaches this oil to water interface, there's another monolayer 
uh, on this uh, at this interface that will acquire a second monolayer of the bilayer. So a cell membrane is made of lipid bilayer. So there are two monolayer. The first monolayers are basically already in this droplet. The second monolayer is acquired at this interface. So you get a something called uh, you get a lipid bilayer vesicle. Okay. So um, uh, and this is just an image showing you the actin structure that can be encapsulated within this. You're not seeing the vesicle itself. I'm, um, it's not labeled, uh, but the vesicle is basically a, a spherical structure that encapsulates these very beautiful actin structures. Um, and we can use this technique you know, to produce a large number of these uh, artificial cell skeleton within a, a, a giant vesicle. And we can visualize them using fluorescent microscopy. Uh, at, uh, we can do this at a very high yield. Um, so I mentioned about this fasten as a short cross linker, and this is very uh, uh, is known to generate uh, these thick bundles that will be protrusive. Okay, so if you encapsulate this uh, fasten actin in a GUV, it forms structure like this, where the actin is 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 thick. It's like uh, imagine bringing on um, uh, sticks together, and these will be mechanically much more rigid, and it actually pushes on the membrane and deform the membrane. Um, and if you illuminate this with light, you can generate. Uh, some phototoxicity to the to the to the proteins, and that actually depolymerizes the actin, and you can see that the shape is restored to spherical shape. So the actin filaments can push on the push on the membrane, um, but if you remove this this actin's uh, network, it it gets restored back to a spherical shape. Um, so what happens uh, uh, when another actin crosslinker uh, alpha actin is added? So I talk about this long crosslinker. Um, so if you incorporate actin, uh, alpha actin and, and, and actin together, you see a rate of different uh, architecture uh, and their size dependent. So I won't get into this too much, um, but in the small uh, GUVs, you know, giant vesicles, you see more ring-like. And as you get to larger vesicles, you have uh, this more entangled actin network. Um, and this is something that we have um, sort of studied extensively. Uh, but what's interesting is when you start mixing FASTEN, the short crosslinker and uh, alpha actin, the long crosslinker together, and you see something different. You see, well, you start to observe uh, new structures uh, that are like astro-like. So there is a central domain that are very um, uh, intense, and then they have bundles radiating out of this. So here's a 3D uh, skeletonization uh, uh, image analysis that we did. You can see, you know, these um, uh, bundles are radiating outward, and there's a central cluster. So this started to look like something that is segregated. Okay, so we want to ask, you know, where are the proteins? Where are the proteins in this in this uh, acid structure? So if you fluorescent label these proteins, you will see that alpha actin is primarily enriched in the middle. Now these images aren't so um, uh, clear, but but the fasten, the fluorescent label fasten, are found in these uh, bundles, and this is the label actin. And uh, if you look at the the traces of um, intensity analysis, you can see alpha actin is primarily enriched in these. Uh, in, in, in the center, whereas these uh, facet is along these uh, spikes, you know that 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 radiates out of from the from the uh, from the center. So this is the acid structure. Um, so want to understand how this can actually happen. As I recall, you know, as you recall, these uh, uh, you know these uh, crosslinker are different sizes. So uh, one can imagine the clusters are in the middle. Uh, with the long cross linkers and the short cross linker will radiate them outward. So um, to sort of get some mechanistic understanding, we turn to uh, simulation. So uh, in collaboration with Aaron Dinner at the University of Chicago, uh, his lab actually developed uh, se you know, several years ago this uh, active filament network simulation. Um, basically, they can uh, model uh, filaments as, as uh, one-line chains and with beads as you know, part of the filaments with springs linking them together. They can also model the cross linker as well. And they ran this in a uh, kinetic Monte Carlo simulation scheme to sort of look at binding of these crosslinker to a set of uh, filaments that are uh, in this, uh, in this uh, 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 I guess, in this uh, boundary condition. Um, once they do that, um, this is a spatial distribution pattern. So this is actually now converted to, it's like a probability density map of some sort that uh, essentially look at how probable can you find a crosslinker in, uh, in, in, in the GUV based on a certain condition. So if you look at the top, this is a alpha actin uh, only condition. So, um, you know, this is quite granular, but you can see that there's alpha actin everywhere in this, in this vesicle. If you look at fasten alone, this is what you see. Now, if you combine alpha actin and fasten together in random simulations, you'll see that the alpha actin now is sort of more enriched in the, in the center domain. And then, and then you see uh, fasten uh, less enriched in the middle and more enriched along this, the, 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 the side. So that's the sort of the, the, the general idea from this uh, simulation work. So it actually matches uh, reasonably well to our uh, experimental observation 
where the alpha actinin is sort of in the middle, and then the fasten bundle is uh, go, going outward. And um, it makes sense as you want to minimize the bending energy and the, the energy cost of mixing these two cross linker together. Uh, so this is a, a type of sorting that happens in, uh, we think could happen in living cell because the cell doesn't have information to say, hey, where does this protein go? It has to rely on the physics of, uh, of, 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 uh, of these semi-flexible polymers. Okay, so real quick to, to um, uh, to you know, the essential of this work was to look at um, how um, active motors might actually uh, govern some of these uh, shape transformations. So, uh, as I mentioned, there are cross linkers, but also motor proteins that will contract uh, active networks. And here is a, you know, you probably all know that we contract our muscle through uh, this motor protein called myosin, forming these filaments that move its head towards the plus end, generate a a a a, a uh, contraction, you know, toward the middle here. So you can shorten the uh, these these uh, end to end distance. So we want to know how do we how does this um, incorporation of molecular motor um, change the self assembly of this actin network? So that was the next question we want to ask. And then how does this change the shape of the of the membrane? Okay. So we have encapsulated these actin system uh, in these spherical compartment, and they remain spherical. But what happens if we start incorporating uh, molecular motor in this in this system? Um, and this is just to show you, uh, without showing any data, is we map some type of phase diagram uh, with a different combination of uh, cross-linking proteins, all in the presence of myosin. So this is not uh, this is sitting here. Is that all these uh, morphology or architecture uh, have myosin in there, and we have different type of cross-linkers, and we see different type of morphology. So the the presence of an absence of proteins will really govern the the, the dynamics of these actin system and allow different architecture to sort of uh, show up. Um, show up. Um, but when you start having, uh, and this gets a little bit more, more detail into uh, a type of actin network that you find in cell are these things called cortex. So uh, the cell membrane, underneath the cell membrane, there's this thin layers of, of uh, actin network that uh, essentially allow the cell to be mechanically rigid and, and be able to resist deformation. Um, so this is a branch network that is assembled by uh, this uh, protein called ARP3 complex that forms branches. And, uh, and the way we do this is, uh, is using an activator of this, uh, this ARP3 complex that we put in uh, uh, to the membrane that interacts with the membrane, allows this branch to form. So just think about it as a very thin shells of polymer that lines the inner side of, of, this, of this vesicle. Now to this, we added the myosin as well. So if you have this cortex, the cortex will generate forces directly contracting the actin over. And this is what happens in, in the dividing cell that, uh, uh, that is actually one of the, the, the way that, that, that uh, cell division can occur. But in any case, when we start adding this uh, full system together with the cross thinkers and, and myosin, we start seeing something where uh, the GUV the is no longer spherical. There's a little blep here, it's actually a large blep. Uh, so what blep is, is basically extrusion of a, of a, of a, of a membrane of a, uh, of, in a cell, this actually happens in, in living cells. Um, so we think what we think is happening is this cortex is generating a contractile force that is essentially almost like extruding um, you know, the membrane out of it. So here's another example of a spherical vesicle um, labeling actin, and you can see uh, at a certain angle that we, we uh, project that we can see a little butt that, that sort of sticks out of it. And we think this, we only see this when we include mouse. So when there's contractile forces that we see this vesicle is no longer spherical and it's actually uh, deformed. Okay. Um, so to wrap up this part of the talk, um, going a little bit uh, behind, that we uh, have developed an experimental platform for studying the cell skeletal vesicle. Um, and then uh, and this cross thinker compete with actin to uh, drive different uh, actin network architecture. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this, you know, adding mouse and actually leads to this blebbing phenomenon. So where we want to go with this is we actually uh, have this very ambitious project of trying to see if we can um, uh, develop uh, you know, a self-dividing uh, vesicle. So using uh, the proteins I've described, if they can form a ring, uh, and this is what happens in the living cells that actually, if you, if you allow this ring to contract, it can actually divide uh, this vesicle into two, okay? So we're thinking about different ways to, uh, to, to do this. Okay, I should say that this, the second part of work is all done by my postdoc, Yasha, who's here, uh, and, and, and has done more work than just this, but uh, uh, I wanna give him credit for that. Uh, the last piece of work is uh, done by a PhD student in, uh, well, now he's actually just graduated, defended about three weeks ago. So he's now Dr. Wipshed, um, uh and uh, on architectural active networks and how it governs self-stiffness. 
So uh, I will go through this relatively quickly because I want to get to the end where I want to show you a really fun video. So, um, so when the DAP, uh, part of his dissertation, again, he, he does many, many different things. I'm going to highlight some of the things he did. Uh, is is uh, he's interested in manip manipulating uh, cells using you know micro manipulation. So there are a variety of ways that you can deform a cell or a vesicle. Uh, he has tried a, a variety of ways, but he wanted to uh, use a very simple setup called electrodeformation. By applying a AC electrophile uh, to a vesicle, you can distort the shape of a vesicle. He wanted to ask, you know, how does the incorporation actor network alter the deformation, electrodeformation of this? Uh, the system. So, um, so essentially, it's a very simple uh, setup with copper tape. You, you drive this with uh, your AC at this electric field, and for just a few seconds, um, the GUV would deform with the uh, uh, major and minor axis here. That's how we're quantifying these. Um, so, in the absence of actin, so just having a buffer, you can see that uh, you know uh, the, the the vesicle is a little bit deformed. Uh, and then, if you encapsulate if actin, so if actin is filamentous actin. Um, and you're seeing just fluorescence, there's no structure whatsoever uh, that you see. You know, so here's the A to B, uh, it's slightly dampened. So it's a slightly lower uh, A to B ratio compared to the no buffer case, oh, sorry, the, the buffer case. Now, what happens if you start encapsulating useful uh, or interesting uh, uh, actin architecture is uh, introduce the cortex. So if you uh, put an uh, actin cortex in this GV, so this is the actin that lines the membrane. Now all of a sudden you don't see this deformation anymore. It's actually very, very small. I mean, you can, um, and if you use an actin crosslinker, the alpha actin that I talked about earlier, uh, you have some crossing network in there. You, you still dampen the, def, uh, the deformation a little bit, uh, but not as drastic. So here uh, you can see the actin cortex really reduce the, the A to B ratio compared to uh, the crosslinker. And those are all lower than, um, uh, than the, the, the actin case, okay? Um, so, you know, we're interested not only in doing this in uh, a reduced system, uh, but also looking at this in cells. And the context of the cell work that Nadab did is to look at how external forces might affect this actin organization that confers this mechanical um, uh, resistance to, to deformations. So uh, for this, we um, had a project, and, and, and this is wrapping up. The project is we wanted to understand how does a cell uh, behave mechanically uh, in microgravity? So uh, of course, you know, doing research in microgravity is difficult. Um, so we uh, begin by looking at this in simulated microgravity and very proud to say that this was actually an ME450 project uh, in the fall of 2019 before the pandemic. Uh, the team did a, ph a phenomenal job and they actually built this. Uh, it's a two gimbal system that rotate. Uh, and if you think about this as, you know, essentially you, you have a time average uh, gravity, you know, because gravity always go down as you rotate. Uh, over a long time, you can actually get a, a much reduced gravity. Uh, we also collaborate with Brent Gillespie, one of his uh, students. Uh, we actually measure this uh, uh, time average uh, gravity at the end of six hours, about 0 0.000123 uh, Gs. Um, and yeah, and these are driven by two different uh, motors. And we did kinematics and also a new control algorithm that samples the, the space of, 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 the, of the point on the sphere very uniformly. So this was actually published in, in, a, in, a, in a journal with all four undergrads included. So it was great. Um, so what we did with this is we subject our cells, uh, the cells that we work with this is, is, is uh, osteoblast. Um, we subject them to the similar gravity for different amount of time. Now, this is what the osteoblast looks like. Uh, if you don't subject them to, to, to this treatment, uh, at 1G, you have uh, actin that are forming these really nice stress fibers. Uh, tubulin marks the microtubule and the nucleus. Uh, after three hours, they start to uh, uh, detach, you know, or, and they start to, to, to contract a little bit more, uh, very disorganized actin in six hours look more or less the same. Um, so we, we can quantify their uh, sort of uh, morphology, uh, morphological features by looking at circularity. So one is obviously more spherical and, 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 um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, close to zero is more polarized. So uh, this sort of matches exactly what we um, uh, observed. Uh, we can also quantify area, as you can sort of imagine, uh, the cells are very well spread when it's 1G and then a high, uh, you know, when you subject it for, for some amount of time, the cells are, are smaller. Um, so what we want to do is want to measure the mechanical properties of these cells after this uh, treatments of uh, similarly microgravity. Uh, for this, uh, we developed a microfluidic chip many years ago, uh, and, and this is uh, what that looks like is we have a, a uh, so this is not so important. So if you look at this region, this is a, a meandering channel that goes up and down. There's a little trapping cup here where the cells would be trapped and there's a aspiration channel and there's a pressure drop across this long channel. 
Um, and, and, you know, this is sort of what we're seeing over here in the simulation uh, from console that you can see a high pressure over on the left and then low pressure here uh, due to pressure drop across this long channel. Uh, very low velocity in the trapping cup, so very low shear stress in that, in that scenario. Uh, but the key is that you develop a pressure difference. So if you have a pressure difference, the cells are being aspirated and they can deform. And this is analogous to the pipe aspiration that people normally do with cells and vesicles, but we convert this to a microfluidic uh, uh, setup. Um, so when we do this type of measurements for 1G uh, and different hours of microgravity, and these are cells that are labeled with a dye, so you can sort of track the shape changes, and you can see uh, when we analyze them, uh, we, we use a, a, um, a sort of model that's uh, probably not entirely correct. It's a uh, homogeneous elastic solid, assuming that cells is a homogeneous elastic solid, and um, we can quantify the deformations and then uh, essentially uh, get an estimate of the Young's modulus. Uh, as you can see at the six hour treatment, the cells become softer. Um, obviously there's caveat because we're doing this experiment still on 1G. We treat the cell for six hours, we do the experiment. Uh, there could be some recovery of the cells, uh, cell skeleton, but nevertheless, we, we, we did observe a, a difference here. Okay, so in the remaining two minutes, I wanna, uh, this was not just microgravity, uh, similar microgravity, we actually did this in real microgravity. Uh, this is probably my my last uh, uh, second last slide. So actually, we had the uh, opportunity to collaborate with Space Tango. It's a it's a private company uh, in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, so first of all, it's funded by the NSF. Obviously, we cannot do this uh, without without their support here. Um, the experiments are are packaged into a box. Um, uh, space, uh, it's called the Cube Lab, and this box is. Uh, um, you know, completely automated. So, you know, engineers just need to send commands and this thing will just run and so on. It took many years of development, uh, but we're happy that we uh, took two flights. One is uh, 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 last fall, November 7, and then we just took another flight a month ago uh, out of Cape Camaro uh, on the SpaceX 27. So what I'm gonna leave you with is um, a video of, um, I actually made a trip of about 12 hours to Cape Canaveral just to be able to watch this. So you're seeing uh, the flight was, uh, on March 15, on uh, at 8:30, I landed at five o'clock. Um, drove about an hour there, you know, watched a flight, and then went back to the to the airport. Um, slept for four hours, and my student Samuel was with me. Uh, we got on the six o'clock flight and made it back, and went to teach. Right, so um, all good. All right. Oh, sorry, I gotta show this video. Okay, so it's only a, me a minute video. Oh, hope this works. Oh no. Okay, I gotta make this work. Hang on a second here. Uh, a switch from your laser pointer. Yeah, no. Okay. I didn't check this one. Well, otherwise, it. Hmm? Well, well, yeah, this is what last thing I show, and I have a just a small. Uh, yeah, because I have a I have a laser pointer. Wasn't it this year? This year. Oh, did I? Oh, sorry, 2023. I might, my mistake. Copy and paste them wrong. Yeah. So March, March 15th of, of uh, yeah. So there you go. Oh, is there sound? Hey, 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 Wow. So all the cells are doing now in the space. Uh, they, they return to Earth. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that was that was phenomenal. Uh, it was an amazing experience. I actually missed the first launch because uh, they had a twenty hour, twenty four hour scrub, and I had to come back to teach. So I left on a Sunday. Um, but anyways, I, I made it a second time. Um, yeah, it should be 2023. Sorry about that. All right, my last slide is, is the following. I, I hope um, I thought through a lot about how to structure this talk and decide to center around cell skeleton. And to me, this is the remarkable material that allows the cell to maintain its mechanical rigidity, allows the cell to move, um, and sort of want to use this as an analogy that, uh, you know, a competition people can have is, you know, make the most stable toothpick structure. And here is a bunch of toothpick that can sustain a very, very large load. Uh, the cell's able to do that by stitching together different polymers, semi-flexible polymer. Each individually has no ability to resist load, but it works collectively uh, to generate uh, forces and maintain mechanical rigidity. So uh, the last part of talk really showed you 
um, you know, uh, by the way, I did not emphasize it's the same concentration of actin inside these vesicles. Okay, same concentration. So it's, it's the architecture of the actin network that really allow its ability to resist load. And if you think about it, the cells are able to very dynamically regulate this uh, in the living cells. Obviously, we're not there yet. I would love to be able to uh, find a way to dynamically regulate this in, in, in real, uh, sorry, in real time. Um, and it also show you uh, sort of to wrap up the cell stiffness uh, from the microgravity experiment, um, which we have evidence showing at least in the simulated microgravity that uh, that they do impact uh, cell skeleton structure, therefore uh, impacting the the, uh, the stiffness of a cell. All right, so I cannot do this work without my lab. A lot of them are here uh, today. Um, so I show you work from Grace, uh, Yashra, and Adap, um, and uh, I only listed the collaborators that are involved in three studies I talk about. Um, I collaborate pretty widely across a lot of uh, probably close maybe 20 collaborators around um, and the funding sources here. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ellen, yeah. for a fascinating presentation. As always, Miss Ellen, no drama. No drama. <laughs> no drama. No, I'm not sure. <laughs> Questions? Hey, yeah. Ellen, um, yeah, I, I want to ask you. So obviously, uh, we, we always, when we conduct research, we're always thinking about what are the downstream applications. Um, but of course, I, I, I don't want to push you towards that. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to your movie, motivating your research program. It's a, like a segment of cut cell, right? It can mm -hmm. it still almost have a machinery function which very showing behaviors. I'm talking about cell migration. Yep, yep, yep. So in your, in your synthetic models, what you think are missing kind that will allow you eventually face those? Sure, sure. Yep, yep. Great question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, Shumbing's question is, you know, um, is the movie I show with a fragment of fish grass I, has the ability to move. And my goal is to try to recreate that. Uh, what are some of the challenges in, uh, you know, in, in, in towards that goal? Um, uh, may, may, there are many of them. Uh, this is my life volunteer, you know, creating a cell-like system that can autonomously move and chasing after whatever you want to chase it. Um, but I think that one of the critical uh, piece is the sensing ability. And my lab also works on channels and, and receptors, we constitute them and being able to link some type of biochemical signaling to then regulate the cell skeleton network. Uh, I think that is a, a grand challenge, um, but something I'm very interested in, in, in solving. I think, you know, um, I did write some, you know, proposal around that. We'll see what happens, but uh, yeah. But, but I think, you know, be able to, to have information transfer, that would be a first step. And then I think also figure out how to uh, hear these things. So, because right now these are just, Vesicle, they're spherical, yeah, but a lot of challenges, yeah. So your question or your discussion of this jamming versus unjamming, it, it, it implied to me, and maybe I'm taking this off in a crazy direction, that if you could have the, the original cancer cells stay where they were, mm -hmm. then they wouldn't spread and you wouldn't have metastasis. Yeah. Is that a possible scheme for treating cancer or would that not necessarily yeah. accomplish it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So so some of our recent work, although I think in the end it may still be challenging, but some of our recent work to look at cell migration out of 3D spiral is that if you increase the confinement stress around, um, that the cells would not be able to escape. So it's almost like push, push, pushing so hard that the cells would not be able to, to leave its cage. Um, and I think, Precisely, right, Andre. Like, if we can keep the cells in the jam state, then they won't be able to to, to invade. Um, but but the, the the challenge is we were working with a virtual system. Cell naturally has the ability to degrade its matrix, so they make it softer in order to migrate out. So unless we also block the cell's ability to degrade its environment, otherwise we, it, it should be difficult. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. So uh, with respect to you know cell migration and and cell response to forces, you know, your lab takes this on experimentally. I'm curious, what is the current status on the ability to maybe reproduce this behavior or predict this behavior numerically? Is this yeah. um, an area of research that's active, or yeah. or is it still very challenging? No, no, yeah, Krishna just walked out, but he has done some work around that of, of, of you know and some simple models of migrating, but there are also others that uh, essentially model the cell skeleton in great detail and show its ability to move like a, a boundary. But if you're thinking about, I guess there are different scale. If you're thinking about collective migration, 
um, you know, that, that would use a very different type of tools. So the, I know there are folks that are trying to recreate a computational cell like completely. I mean, there's, yeah, and that's a different levels of uh, complexity there. Yeah, but it, it's a very, very busy area, I would say. Yeah, certainly uh, modeling has, has, has done a great amount of contribution there, yeah. yeah. Very nice, Colin. Oh, Very cool stuff. Um, and the work you did with the U Chicago folks. Mm -hmm. um, they're um, separate from from the architecture that you get. Is there a role of connectivity within a given architecture? That's an explored. Uh, when you say connectivity of cross cross link, cross -link yeah, and sort of the net what mm -hmm. what the network. Structure actually is because yeah 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 sure 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 texture you could have a different yeah picture. yeah yeah so the way they started out I actually didn't show the raw data they actually had to pre-template a, a a pattern and then just look at how crosslinker would bind to that um, so there's I guess in 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 this particular world we did not look at uh, the archi how the architecture would evolve we're simply looking at binding and unbinding and and I suppose you could do something like that if we use a different simulation scheme of having them self-assemble um, completely. But but in this, I have to say, in this particular one, we, we basically have them as, as filaments already and then just looking at where the cross-linker land. <laughs> it's a, yeah, yeah. But we can we can definitely try something different. It's just what's available in this, uh, in, in, you know, when we work with them, yeah. Yeah. Good luck. Good yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right, it's one, huh? Oh, sure, please. Yeah. Uh, in your second story, you hinted at myosin to having a motor effect. Mm -hmm. But isn't it, couldn't it be a cross linker? Uh, yeah, it could be a cross linker as well. Does it form filaments? Yeah. How much ATP is there? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, I should say we 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 are not looking at it as as a as a. These are non-muscle myosin, right? Correct. Uh, muscle. No muscle myosin. Never mind. Okay, muscle myosin. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it can have a crossing grade effect. I think so. It, it's it's a it's something we bought commercially. It's full length contract. It does form myosin. Correct. Yeah, it does form myosin in implements. So but it could be a cross. Self-assembly under the ionic condition mm. of the GUV. I, I guess you could. We don't. We don't label this though, right? We don't. Do we have a label? Like filament formation of myosin. Mm. My, one of the tricks of myosin too is that yeah, I can set it filaments. Self assembles into yeah. six filaments. That's the, what the large LMM portion. Is. Based on the concentration of the uh, calcium chloride that we use. Uh, we are kind of know that at that uh, KCL concentrations, myosin is spontaneously formed the filaments. And yeah. uh, because we use like different salts, at that concentration, we know it forms filaments. And basically, we are forming these myosin mini filaments, interacting with active and fostering them. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, I uh, actually, one thing we are looking, which would be very interesting, is to see. Uh, like how uh, non filaments interact uh, with the system. And uh, for a contractor ring to assemble and contract and constrict the GUV for the cell division project that Alan showed, we will probably need a uh, myosin two motor that does not. Does not, does not for filament. Yeah, yeah. 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 